welcome to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast which is about board games. Very surprising. Now, we didn't have a show last week, and Mark graciously, you know, stepped under the bus for that one, but I think it was pretty well my fault. I was doing a lot of moving and was very busy, so I do apologize for that. That being said, we are going to be going into a our summer schedule this week. So we have good news and bad news. The bad news is, yes, we are going back to summer schedule for a variety of reasons uh, past anyone's interest, much less yours. But we've figured out a way, we think, to maintain the summer schedule so as to allow us to continue doing it without taking any weeks off. If you'll recall, last year we went to a once-every-two-week schedule, but we're not going to be doing that going forward. What we're going to do now is every other week we're going to do a game review in depth. We're going to have a feature game, and every other week we're going to have a topic. So this week is the start of our summer schedule, and we're going to have the Aurus, our as-yet-unnamed retrospective intro segment, the games we played last week, the news, why it doesn't matter, no feature game, And we're going to have our topic, and our topic this week is good games that induce pain. And next week, we're also going to have an episode, but we're going to just do games we played last week, the news and why it doesn't matter, and our feature game. So this is going to carry us through to the summer months, and we hope that you accept the fact that you'll be getting about as much swag as you did before, although slightly parceled out. So this is the compromise we've come up. Uh, Please feel free to send any complaints to the typical source at Air Canada. I'm sure they're, they're very, very keen to talk about board games, as they always are. And we hope that you understand that this is what we've come up with and that this is what we – maybe I should just keep circling around and saying the okay. same thing, three things yeah. over. Just you know. One more time. One more time? About the second time. So – This is what you're going to get and we hope you like it. So the game we reviewed last year, Mark, was Mage Knight. Now, since then, they've come out with this giant box of Mage Knight where you can get all the expansions and the base game all in one box to make it even that much more exciting – and I still have not played it. <laughs> That's not to say that Mage Knight isn't a great game, because it is a great game. But I just think that the game, other games that are coming out now do just as much as Mage Knight did and have a lot less rules over hang and a lot easier to teach and a lot easier to set up and go. It's funny that you say that because I actually think the opposite is true. We've spent a lot of time over the course of the past year talking about various adventure-y type games, right? We, Whether you want to include things that are slightly further afield, things like Crisis at Steamfall, whether you want to talk about things like City of Kings, whether you want to talk about lots of other things like that. And I honestly think that in terms of where it's situated in the genre, Mage Knight still holds its place as the king of what it's trying to do, which is to say a meaty, gamerly game about overland adventure and combat. And all the other times that I played the other contenders to the throne, I, I've really been feeling that either I wanted to do something that was just about fighting, something a little bit more like Too Many Bones or Street Masters or something along those lines, or something that was more substantial like Mage Knight. And yes, it is absolutely the case that in terms of setup and in terms of rules overhead, it's considerable. In terms of playing time, it's, it's nothing to sneeze at. I've still made the effort to pull it out in the years since we've reviewed. It's not something I play all the time. But it is absolutely something that I appreciate. I haven't tried the new Ultimate Edition, but whatever. I have all the components uh, anyway, except for the, f- the the five additional cards they put out. And you can buy those separately from Woods Kids. So good on them for making that available. But every time I see someone talking about how, you know, how is Mage Knight held up? Has it aged? And people say, oh, well, you know, it feels awfully clunky. It's always felt reasonably clunky. You know, and I say that as someone who loves the game. But I really do think that Mage Knight still is the king of what it's trying to do. Yeah, for deck building, I think it's very close to a Gloomhaven, though. When you think about it, it's like a hand management, deck building, you know, adventure game. And I'd really much rather play Gloomhaven than Mage Knight. But for like a solo play or or just the artwork alone and just the way it works, it is still, like you said, it's still holding up. And I I still enjoy it, even though I haven't played it. The comparison to Gloom, Gloomhaven, I think, is an illustrative one. I think that Gloomhaven is a better game, but in terms of rules overhead, I don't think that there's substantially less. There is less. Gloomhaven is a more approachable game rules-wise, but I don't think that the difference is considerable. And in terms of setup and overall administrative overhead, I really do think that Mage Knight is better because the sheer amount of components you need to wrestle in an average game of Gloomhaven is really, really high, even higher than that of Mage Knight. And in Gloomhaven, you have to deal with the additional campaign stuff. And and maybe I'm alone in really, you know, finding the campaign stuff to be more of a, of a burden than a benefit. Although, with a possible exception of in context like Gloomhaven. But it, it's weird. I, I think that uh, my appreciation for Mage Knight has only gone up and uh, yours seems to be a little bit on the wane. So Agreed. 
So that's what we reviewed last year. Let's talk about the games we played last week. I had uh, a good week of playing games that we've reviewed in the past. I had a great game of Street Masters, a great game of Pandemic Fall of Rome, a great game of Cerebria. Those are all three games that we've had feature games. By the way, those are episodes 32, 51, and 57, respectively, for those that want to go through our uh, excellent back catalog. Uh, another game that I got to play again, I talked about this uh, briefly, was Imperius, and talked about how it was a drafting and sort of area control-ish type game, which on first play seemed very, very, very random. And I was curious to see if it was going to feel a little bit more substantial and a little bit more deterministic on subsequent plays. I played it again with three this time. An interesting thing about Imperius is among its spans, there's no strong consensus about what number at which it's best. It plays at two, three, and four. And I have found people defend each of those player counts as being the ideal way to play Imperius. The first time we played it was with four, which certainly does seem to be a way to maximize the chaos and uh, the uncertainty of what's going on. With three and at a second playing, and I think it's it's a little bit of both that contributed to this, I enjoyed it substantially more. It's still pretty crazy. The other two people were new players. I didn't play it with Walker because I decided to have a good time this time. And they seemed to think that it was uh, a lot more deterministic than the other people we played with the first time. So suffice to say that Imperius is something that I am going to make the effort to try to try, try to see its depth. I'm going to play it a couple more times at least probably, and you would express some interest in playing it again. And for a 20-minute game, you know... Even if it's completely arbitrary, I'm willing to forgive a game 20 minutes if it turns out to be completely arbitrary. And I do find it awfully visually appealing. And as I commented before, sometimes you get these glimpses of these clever plays where you're not sure if it's a clever play or if it's just something that happened randomly. And I, if it's the case that those clever plays are actually possible under, under controlled conditions, then we might be talking about one of the best fillers that I've played in the past five years. So I'm very curious to see if that manifests. And that has been my further experience with Imperius finally got Baron Park to the table after almost two years of not playing it. I played it, you know, back at UK Games Expo a long time ago in Bethlehem. And you played it with the designer Uwe Rosenberg, right? Yes. I played it with Uwe. It was a great time. Sorry, this is... And then, he, and then he put it out under a ghost name for some reason. I don't understand why he put it under a fake name. No, maybe he, maybe he didn't think it was going to do well. I don't know. It was an honor to you. He put it under the name Walker Harding. Ah. Uh, as he, a testament had, he, both to your excellent name and your pecs. He had, so, such, a, he had such a good... Uh, a good time, I guess, yeah. Sorry, this is an inside joke. One of our early mistakes at So Very Wrong About Games is we misattributed Baron Park to Uwe Rosenberg. It was not designed by Uwe Rosenberg. It was designed by Philip Walker Harding. So there you go. I don't know how we made that mistake. Anyway, I don't know why I didn't play with the achievements because when I played the first time we had the achievements, it, it definitely will add to the game. Playing it just straight up is a very, uh, you know, entryway game. Very basic. Definitely, if you're going to play Baron Park, play with the advanced rules. But other than that, I think it's a great game, easy to teach. It was a two-page rule book. You're placing tiles, making a cool little Tetris shapes, you know, getting more. There is, a, there is definitely options there, like choices to make. It's not as though it's just, you know, place a tile anywhere you want. There are, you can look ahead, see that will fit, pick the, cho- pick the ones you need. Uh, like skip your turn of of uh, placing the ideal piece to get because you can see one that's about to disappear stuff like that what do you think of baron park mark i was pleasantly surprised i wasn't expecting a whole heck of a lot and i was very pleased with what it delivered you're absolutely right that there are substantial trade-offs to be made both in terms of tempo and in terms of placement one of the things that baron park does as a very very simple tile laying game is it does interesting things with your tile supply most of the time with these simple tiling games, you draw a tile or you draw some number of tiles and you place them. But with Baron Park, the key is to get the tiles that you want to place. And that is where it primarily introduces player interaction because you don't it's not one of those tiling games where you share the field. You all have your own little bear parks. Why they're bear parks, I don't know. If you're going to have bear parks, at least have the possibility of the bears escaping and eating somebody. Yes, I know that's terribly un-PC for all the defenders of bears and the wildlife, but whatever. I've watched enough Stephen Colbert to know that bears are godless killing machines. And I just, you know, I played Dinosaur Island, and the one thing that Dinosaur Island got right was the possibility of the things you're going to to gawk at escaping and murdering everybody. Granted, it was unreasonable for me to want that at Baron Park, but setting all that aside... It's cute, it's nice, and the fact that you have to deliberately go after certain tiles to place in competition with other people, I thought was really neat. I don't know anything about the achievements because I haven't played with them, but uh, I'm glad that after hearing about this game forever that it turned out to be not a snooze fest. And that's Baron Park. 
played a game called Burning Suns. Now, in, in the context of false advertising, I was very disappointed to see that Burning Suns was not, in point of fact, a game about pyrotechnic family discipline. Was uh, it about orcs? No, it was. Space what? orcs? No, there were no space orcs. Oh. <laughs> close, though. Uh, there were space devils. Is that close enough? Close enough. Yeah. Burning Suns is a 4X game that was kickstarted in uh, 2013, and fulfillment is not completed. So that just goes to show you what's going on there. I got my copy in trade with somebody, and I uh, I actually inquired on Board Game Geek about whether some of the extra components would be available for sale later on. And some people very gently pointed out to me, it's like, there is no later on yet, Big Knee. Later on is, is a ways off. It's like, ooh, this is embarrassing. Yeah. That having been said, it is in some ways it's very much a uh, first-time Kickstarter design. A lot of the components in terms of the graphic design especially look a little amateurish. The cover looks like something out of a 1990s PS1 game. And there are a number of details about the game that are less usable than they could be. But I will say, I had been prepared for uh, you know a lot of the, the failings of a standard forex genre over long, tons and tons of rules questions, especially because there are complaints a mile long on Board Game Geek about the rules. I found the rules pretty tight, honestly, all things considered. I don't know, maybe we just got lucky and didn't get the weird stuff. And it was a reasonably quick experience, too. We played with four uh, first-time players and you know set up rules explanation teardown. It was uh, less than two hours. And I, I, I quite enjoyed it. I thought it was pretty good. In terms of the super stripped down 4X games, we've, we've talked about Warpgate and we've talked about Quantum. Those are excellent games that you can finish in an hour-ish. And Eclipse is still probably my favorite of the 4X genre. But, you know, there we're talking about three hours and lots and lots of components at least. But Burning Suns, in, in terms of the middle, the, the sort of middle range game, it and uh, Empires of the Void with Key to the Universe are pretty much the, the only two hour-ish 4X games that I thought were reasonably satisfying in the in that era. The key hook to Burning Suns is that you have a framework, uh, a race, and uh, sort of an ideology. So you have these three modular things. And so the asymmetry, the possible combinatorics going on are huge. It's like, uh, it's like small world on steroids. And it leads to some very interesting asymmetries. Like these people can't really do diplomacy, but don't get into a fight with them. And they have these weird powers. And I liked it. I like playing with toys in the context of 4X games. And if you're able to do that without overloading the system too much, I think that there's a lot there. So I don't think it's going to set the world on fire, no pun intended. But I really enjoyed my time with Burning Suns. And I'm looking forward to trying it again. Uh, you know, graphic graphic problems notwithstanding and the fact that some of the components are, are, are a bit off. But it is the case that you do have in the core box five different complete sculpts of ships, which is not which is nothing to sneer at. And the, the key visual appeal for me was that you have these special ships that hold dice, and the dice indicate the hit points, and they just s- slot into the ships themselves. And that's awfully cute, and it is as fun as I, I wanted it to be. So that was my experience with Burning Suns, and uh, I'm hoping to get it to the table again soon. Then we got Downfall Deluxified TM to the to the table. Oh, I just threw up a little in my mouth. It's okay, Mark. It's okay. So it wasn't that bad. Well, that being said. It's the word primarily. It really was. So it's a post-apocalyptic, put your workers out, you know, collect resources, try to spread out as fastly as possible. As quickly, sorry, as fastly? As fastly. As fastly. Fastly. It's Canadian, in case you didn't know. That's well, no, no, no. Uh, you, you, you act fastly after the process of fastification. Gotcha. Yeah. When you're really hungry. So, yeah, so you try to expand extremely quickly while still trying to feed all your workers and fight over resources. I'm looking forward to playing it again. I'm sure we're going to have a lot more to talk about it later when we've when we've tried it a few more times. A lot of the components are very interesting and uh, very deluxified. That, that you're being too charitable, Walker. Say what you really mean. Overly deluxified and unusable? Yes. We, we were playing with, just as one example, we were playing with the expanded map, the, the oversized map tiles. And even then, we were running out of room on the map tiles to do basic things like have a worker collect some resources. Yeah, I have no idea. Like if there's the regular version has small tiles, I have no idea how you would play. Yeah, it seems like a nightmare. So that's downfall. What do you have anything to add other than other than the tiny tiles? Well, we did. We didn't even finish it's, our. Yeah, we didn't. Even we finish. didn't even finish our first game because it was a slog. Now, and I can't even really fault anyone for playing too too slowly. There's a fair amount of simultaneous action, which goes to show you how little player interaction there often is. And it was mostly just a question of how do I get enough food to feed my workers. And I don't mind games that have a strong pressure like that, like Agricola, for example. And indeed, I'm going to talk about games like that later on in our topic. But it 
it felt more like busy work to me than anything else. Now, maybe the end game is where everything comes alive, or maybe if you just play aggressively, everyone starts having more fun. But, I mean, quite frankly, I can't see uh, a sort of survival game where lots of people can starve to death is improved when some angry jerk next door is coming over and stealing all your stuff. But, yeah, we're going to try it again. We're going to come back with more more mature, seasoned, emulsified, and uh, perhaps fermented opinions. But initial impressions were not particularly positive. And that's downfall. That's downfall. Deluxify. Please stop saying that word. TM. By TMG Games. Played Adrenaline with the Team Play DLC. So Adrenaline is a game that is nominally kind of supposed to be a first-person shooter game, but it's actually just uh, an area majority game. Which is fine by me. I love area majority games. And here, instead of controlling over areas, you're just doing damage to people. So the area, the areas that you're trying to influence a majority are moving around, and you're moving around doing all these things. The problem is I, I never really – Adrenaline never really clicked for me because I always felt a little bit more procedural and dry than the sort of over-the-top hyperbolic action that it's supposed to parody. And the guns themselves are all different, which is nice, but the iconography is, for, for, for my abilities, impossible to parse. You have to make reference to the reference sheet to figure out how the guns operate on a basic level, and so you're always passing around these references, and that kind of sucks people out of the game to a certain extent. Uh, the team play DLC adds asymmetric character powers and uh, character unique guns, which are kind of cute, but again, more things to look up, but it's nice to have a little bit of asymmetry, but... Adrenaline just isn't for me. I, I like it. It's mechanically sound. I like everything that it does. And as far as area majority games, it's not particularly offensive. And it's a genre that I like. But I, I don't find it nearly engaging enough. And I think part of it is just the difficulty in interacting with the base elements of, of the guns and the various mechanics. Now, maybe if I played it all the time. This isn't a question like Imperius where maybe a couple other times and I'll, I'll see it go. It's just there are so many different weapons, which is one of the game's strengths. But it prevents me from being able to, to really engage with things on a visceral level. And quite frankly, when I'm playing a game of El Grande, I'm not one of the people who thinks, oh, gee, maybe this game needs more player interaction. Because that, that, that's com- a complete misnomer. El Grande is already a knives-out bash fest. Uh, with far more direct competition than even games like, for example, Downfall. <laughs> and so I don't find that the shift to something like Adrenaline really, really uh, benefits. So while I'm perfectly willing to uh, play it again if somebody puts it in front of my face, I don't think I'm going to be seeking it out, and uh, that's my opinion of Adrenaline. Now on the topic of dry and procedural, let's talk about Pandemic Fall of Rome and what I think I'm feeling about most pandemic games nowadays. Oh, no. It's just dry and procedural. It's like, okay, now we need to trade for this card, now we need to cure that, and then we're done. That's just what it felt. It's like just same, It felt like same old, same old. It's like, okay, now we need to get somewhere to get a card, now we need to do this, now there seems, you know what I mean? It just seemed as though we're just going through the paces of a normal pandemic game as per usual. Not that it, it, it was fun to do, but it, it just it started to feel as though it was the same old, same old. Oh, that's too bad. I really love Fall of Rome. I stand by everything we said in the review. I think that in terms of the way the barbarians move around the map, the way that legions are implicated, I really do think it's a shot in the arm to the formula, and it breaks up the sort of same spatial uh, oddness that a lot of core pandemics have, where just diseases pop up in various random cities and you're always playing whack-a-mole. I really do like the sense of spreading fronts and having to build fortifications and care about the borders and all those other things. And yes, absolutely, I do agree with you that fundamentally games of pandemic are about killing time until you draw the cards you need and then deciding how inefficient you want to be in terms of transferring those cards around. But I think that the better versions of Pandemic do a good job of making you forget that that's what's going on. And I really do think that Fall of Rome does a really good job For of that. For sure. So. If, if I had to play any Pandemic, it would definitely be Fall of Rome every time. For all the reasons you said. It really changes up how it, it's played and makes that part very interesting. But then, like you said at the end, it, oh, but then it always comes back down to waiting for you to get the right cards and then how to get them to the right people at the right time. Oh, well. And that was Pandemic Fall of Rome by Z-Man Games. Played a game of Space Cadets Dice Duel. Space Cadets Dice Duel is probably my favorite game of the Engelstein clan. This was done by Jeff Engelstein and Sydney, Sydney Engelstein. The core Space Cadets game I do not enjoy, but Space Cadets Dice Duel is a team-based competitive game of real-time dice rolling. It's a little bit like Artemis, if any, if any of you have played the, the PC game Artemis, where everyone's divided up into stations. I, it's, it's really quick and really vicious and really frenetic and head-to-head. The problem is, one of the, one of the difficulties with Space Cadets Dice Duel, on top of the fact that a lot of people don't like real-time games and don't like real-time 
team-based games like that because they find it too stressful. It's got a, it's got a lot of rules grit, and that's one of the good things about it. The subsystems matter. The subsystems are detailed, and so what you can do and how to get there and the way the weapon systems work and how you acquire a target lock, they're not complicated, but they're detailed. And so, for one thing, the rules explanation needs to be very, very, very carefully done so that everybody can jump into the real-time element and not worry about the middle of the game and, and, and how it's functioning. So in a niche hobby, I find that Space Cadets Dice Duel is a super niche product, but I absolutely adore it, and it's great. I don't relish the prospect, as I almost always do in a game, of explaining to the weapons officer over and over again, it's like, well, you didn't hit this time because this happened, even when it's the case that it's because I'm bludgeoning them over and over again with the fact that they don't know what they're doing. Anyhow, this was further undercut by the fact that the rules explanation this time was not done by me, and it was relatively cursory, and so a lot of people didn't know what they were doing, but... I really adore the game in the right context. It's absolutely raucous fun. It scales really well from anywhere to 4 to 10 if you want to play it with the expansion um, Die Fighter, uh, which is wonderful. And it's only going to last you about 30 to 45 minutes once you get going. So I highly recommend Dice Duel, even though it's not for every context. And I had a great time with it. So we got a Kickstarter to the table that I wanted to, that I wanted to pledge for, but in the end didn't. It's called Gentis. Now the components are fantastic and the gameplay is really good. A little of the deluxified parts, once again, made the game a little uh, clunkier than it needed to be, right? They didn't actually improve gameplay, which is unfortunate because it's nice when uh, games like Crusaders or, or other games where the deluxified components are either not necessary or or when they are introduced, they actually make the game better. And I'm, and I'm very surprised that some of these games don't include the, the base components as well, so you don't have the choice of choosing which ones to use but anyway this is a fantastic you know multiple ways to victory you know purchasing cards all that are going to work together to improve your engine and you know you need to keep your money up need to keep buying these cards and the way and manipulating you know how expensive you know certain citizens are going to be and waiting your turn like seeing which cards you need and seeing looking around the table, seeing which other people need those cards and see if you can wait until they're cheaper. Stuff like that. Very interesting gameplay, and I'm very much looking forward to playing it again. I found Gantis to be relatively unengaging. I I found the component issues like you did somewhat annoying. And it's basically just a worker placement game where you're just trying to churn out as as many points as possible. The various elements of the game that are novel were very much oversold. Early press reports were praising the action selection to the sky, but it's basically just a worker placement system. And this whole issue, uh, there's an issue of timing in Gentis where basically you either spend an extra action now or an extra action next turn, which is kind of cute. That part was was, was kind of neat, and I uh, haven't really played it enough to really see what the smart move is in most contexts. But mostly it seemed to be about buying and playing high point value cards, which is fine. It just didn't really do much for me. I'm going to play it some more because there might be some depth there. And it's not the kind of game where everything is transparent on first play. But in terms of the, the core systems, I didn't really see much of anything to grab me. And certainly nothing substantial that was novel. So No, it definitely didn't bring, like there was no hook or anything that was huge. The time element was kind of... I really liked how some actions, you know, uh, used up more. But really, it's just like that will cost you more action points than, you know, when you really look at it. It's like exactly. This, this thing costs more. As I say, but, it, it's a worker placement game where some spaces cost two workers and some spaces cost three workers. That's... True, true, true. But uh, it doesn't take much time is what I thought. You know, it, it flowed fairly well. And, and it, even after rules explanation, I think we were done fairly quickly. I was ho- I was just hoping for something a little bit more novel, maybe a little bit more thematic, uh, because I like c- civilization games or even games with a veneer of civilization, but it's pretty darn themeless, and it's pretty mechanical. It still could be engaging after that, but I- maybe I just need to manage my initial disappointment. And so that was my initial reaction of Gentis. Well, that in the I think if they penalized areas, you know, much like they do in Uwe Rosenberg games, if you don't concentrate on some areas, then you get penalized, like because it seems though like you could really concentrate on on certain aspects of the game and just disregard others. And it would be interesting if they penalized you for disregarding those. And that way it would make it a a more rounded game. Maybe. I don't know. Strange to say that from you. You're normally not a fan of, of such penal uh, penalties in this particular game. I think it would, it would benefit. Well, much like uh, downfall, I think more to follow later. Exactly. And that was Gentis. 
played another game of Roll for the Galaxy, which I bring up uh, mostly because I've been reflecting on my views on all the sort of Thomas Lehman tableau builders lately, especially playing more Res Arcana and reflecting on the how all the Galaxy products have been kind of uh, evolving and moving forward with new frontiers and always new material available for Race for the Galaxy, which is great because I think that Race for the Galaxy remains the best tableau builder ever made. And now Roll for the Galaxy has got a new expansion, which I did not try, called Rivalry. We played with Ambition instead. And uh, I I bring it up in part because I was reminded why, when playing Roll for the Galaxy, why I like Roll for the Galaxy, but it is my least favorite of the uh, Race for the Galaxy type products. And that is because in the other ones, primarily Race, you can get away without having a card influx engine. You can... You can either exploit a military engine or do other things or or, or, or just ru- run your consume engine. But when it comes to Roll for the Galaxy, everybody needs to cycle their dice. It is a hard and fast requirement for everyone, no matter what you're doing, that your dice cycle at a good clip. And if you don't have that, you just can't get anywhere. And it made it really made the game feel less open to me when compared to other such games that Layman himself has put out. And so while I like Roll for the Galaxy, I think it's solidifying its its position for me as my least preferred version. I haven't heard you talk about Roll because you played more Roll for the Galaxy than you have Race for the Galaxy, haven't you? For sure. What do you think about Roll for the Galaxy? I, I'm not a fan. Like I said, the, I think the dice rolling becomes uninteresting very quickly in the game where you can manipulate the dice to mean whatever you want them to. So rolling them seems kind of pointless after a while. It's like you can manipulate them, turn them, move them over here, you know, make them whatever you need them to be. So rolling them seems completely arbitrary mm. at a certain point. Well, it does make the game really noisy. It's, that's true. It's true. It also, you know, keeps the name of the game, you know, you know, relevant. You got to get that branding in. There you go. So that was Roll for the Galaxy. Finally, got to play a game I've been looking forward to for a very long time, and that's Brook City. This is the latest output by Adam Sadler and Brady Sadler of Blacklist Games. They put out Street Masters that I just mentioned at the top of the show and is a, we're, we're big fans of here and so very wrong about games. But my initial experiences with Brook City, I've now played it three times at various player accounts and with, with various amounts of, of material stuffed in. It is a sort of elaboration of the system whereby in Street Masters you had these three decks, but mostly it was about beating the snot of the boss uh, or not getting the snot beaten out of you. So it was much similar to its progenitor, namely Sentinels of the Multiverse, which had the same victory and loss conditions, broadly speaking. Sometimes you get another loss condition, sometimes, but generally speaking, not. Brook City has complicated the system, whereby now there's no standardized victory condition. You have your cops, and one loss condition is your cops can get fired. This is sort of a, a, a an homage to 90s era cop movies and television shows of all types. You know, you've got your ripoff from the movie Seven. You've got your ripoff from Lethal Weapon. You've got your ripoff from Fargo, for crying out loud. So they've cast a wide net. And I will point out, and this is this is this is worth noting, that the art for the uh, Blacklist games has gotten much much better at its representations of women. They're not just boob heavy caricatures and uh, sexualized objects. Everyone is still just a ripoff, though. They're all just homages to all existing characters, so that much hasn't changed. But I do give them credit for making a little bit of progress there. And similarly, their upcoming expansion to Street Masters, Aftershock, I haven't seen all the card art yet, but it looks a whole lot better, and it looks like it's continuing that trend. But in Brook City... There's no standardized victory condition. There's a victory condition introduced by each case you're running. So the environment deck, which is usually just background noise in a game of, say, Sentinels or Street Masters, is now how you win. It's the victory condition. And they've done some interesting things with the cases in terms of how they work. They all feel different. But the problem is, once you add in the the details from the unique case decks and the details from the unique criminal, criminal decks, which introduce another loss condition... Suddenly, you've taken a system which was relatively simple but already had a fair bit of details to keep in mind and was very easy to play wrong, and I think they might have gone off the deep end. I think that Brook City might be a couple details too far, such that just running the system properly, just internalizing how to get to where you want to go, is a little bit too much cognitive load for its own good. The game doesn't get too complicated. It's just that once you have about six or seven different cards spread out over the table with a wall of text that you need to internalize in order to just get a basic action done or even to consider what basic action you want to do. At that point, you're ending up with something that's even harder to make decisions in than something like Mage Knight or some of your your heavier Euros. And as a result, uh, the games of Brook City that I played have been uh, much too long. 
and more difficult to play than they needed to be. So I'm, I'm definitely not giving up. I like the, the Sadler Brothers a fair deal in terms of what they put out. And I'm hoping that maybe if I stick to more beginner cases for the, for the earlier bits, some of the fans on Board Game Geek have done yeoman's work in terms of identifying these are beginner, simpler, simpler cases and so forth. But even the simpler ones are pretty involved. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that I can get Brook City manageable. And if so, I'm going to I'm going to see what I can get out of the system. But but most of the time now when playing Brook City, I wish I were playing Street Masters. And that's a bad sign for for games of the system. And I'm wondering if the core system that the Saddlers quote unquote invented, mostly by elaborating Sentinels of the Multiverse, was not designed to run a game this complicated. I'm actually reminded a little bit. The game that Greater Than Games put out right after Sentinels of the Multiverse was called Galactic Strike Force. And it was very similar to Sentinels of the Multiverse. Draw a card, do what it says it does. Just there were these status effects to be tracked all over the place. And the victory and loss conditions weren't straightforward and simple like beating a boss and don't get knocked out. And some of the scenarios were aggressively dumb and it was, it was unplayable. Galactic Strike Force was pretty much unplayable despite having a simple rule set. And I'm not saying that Brook City is that bad. Brook City is definitely better than Galactic Strike Force, but I'm worried if it's the same kind of trend and same kind of design, design problems. So, more on that to follow. I'm going to be playing Brook City uh, some more. I, I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. And you love uh, Street Masters, so I suspect uh, your input would be would be valuable. But so far, eh, it's looking a little shaky, and that's Brook City. All right, now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. So ongoing now on Kickstarter, there is a game called Trickshot. We've talked about that before. This is the newest game by Artem Nichapurov, uh, designer of Warpgate and Guards of Atlantis. This is his hockey game. I've played it a few times on Tabletopia and uh, with the designer, so keep that in mind. But I have to say, uh, even though it was playing online, and I'm very, very slow at playing uh, PC games online, it's a very, very, very quick game. I've seen some concerns posted on Board Game Geek. Is this going to be a quick game? Is this really as, as fast as, as it says? The One of the design goals of Artem Nichaporov was to design a sort of very quick, very playable, very approachable equivalent to Blood Bowl. Uh, where spatial orientation mattered and where your positioning of your players was was of key importance, but it didn't take three hours. A game of trick shot legit takes about twenty to thirty minutes, and I've had a I've had a lot of fun with it. And I don't I do not enjoy the sports. I am not what you would call a sports man, which is I believe how you say that word. Totally. But trick shot is fun. I pledged for it for what it's worth. So you know I'm I'm obviously not getting anything on the back end. I've, I paid for my copy. They're unlocking stretch goals as we speak. And uh, I'm very impressed with what's uh, been done with it visually in terms of the minis and everything else. So at least it's worth a shot, uh, no pun intended. And uh, that's uh, Trick Shot by Wolf Designer. Yeah, all my news is Kickstarter news because it seems pretty slow in the board gaming world. So we already talked about Bloodborne by Simon Games. I just took another quick glance at it, and I'm only talking about it because there's no dice. So that's kind of exciting. You don't make dice pools for a change. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's that's kind of exciting. I didn't really go in depth into the rules, but the fact that, like I said, there was no dice presence made me think that this might be something interesting. So now I'm going to have to see how combat is actually done to see if it's uh, uh, worth looking at. And that's Bloodborne by Simon Games. So Pax Renaissance, another game I've been talking about in past weeks is getting a reprint. Copies on the secondary market are going for a large quantity of money, especially the expansion, which is just a pack of 55 cards. Typically sells for 100 bucks or more. But a Spanish company has been in the uh, works of the past few months doing a deluxe version with a an actual map instead of just a bunch of cards that you laid as a map and chess pieces that look like chess pieces. For those who haven't played Pax Renaissance, the there are these lovely little bishops and lovely little knight pieces because everything in Pax Renaissance is equivalent to a chess piece. But the pawns and the rooks don't look like pawns or rooks. They're cubes and little cylinders, respectively. So I would very much like to see fancier chess pieces. I will regret the fact that it will have a larger box because the box for Pax Renaissance is this adorable twee little thing. But... It has been confirmed that there's going to be an English version of a deluxe version of Pax Renaissance, whether it's going to be the same as the Spanish version, although, you know, less Spanish, is uncertain at this point. But there is a reprint in sight. Uh, so for all of you who've been desperate to get your own, uh, get your hands on either Pax Renaissance or the expansion, there is no need to succumb to the secondary market unless you're exceptionally impatient. So that's Pax Renaissance Deluxe Edition. Also on the topic of reprints, there's Demacher, the venerable Euro game about German politics, which, for those in the know who've been around Board Game Geek since the beginning, it is game number one in the Board Game Geek database. It's a really good game. It was, you know, a three- to four-hour Euro game before that was even conceivable. And now everything is a three- to four-hour Euro game. Well, at least everything designed by Vital Lacerda. And 
It's been out of print for a while. The the only English edition was kind of weak sauce, uh, but it is going to be reprinted in a limited edition run. And uh, I've mentioned this before, but I wanted to mention a specific thing that happened on Board Game Geek because it was simultaneously hilarious and heartwarming. Somebody posted a picture of the prototype board, and it was observed by a number of users that they didn't like it. And then the publisher himself showed up and said, well, wh- what's, what do you not like about the board? You know, this is a, this is a work in progress. We can make changes. And uh, an Eagle Eye user on Board Game pointed out that when viewed from the top, it was mostly pale, but there were sections of, of shaded in darkness on the board that made it look like a certain political symbol in Germany of the early 20th century. It was one of those things that once you see it, it couldn't be unseen because I first saw the picture. It's like, oh, yeah, that looks great. It played various different kinds of demarker boards. I saw this board. I thought it looked fine. But the moment it was pointed out, it's like, oh, yeah, that's totally a swastika, 100%. No, it's not actually a swastika. It just looked a bit like a swastika. And the publisher then showed up in the same threads and, oh, my gosh, you're right. This does, Oh, no, I can't unsee it anymore. So it was changed overnight like that <laughs> as a result of feedback on Board Game Geek. So that's my feel-good story online about constructive criticism and feedback resulting in a superior product. So look forward to the Demaco reprint later this year. All right, my last bit of news is just more Kickstarter stuff. Cleopatra is now up on Kickstarter. We've talked about it as well. It's just the fact that it looks like they're doing a great job. They're going all out on it, just like the original version. It's going to be this giant you know, pyramid with, with all sorts of bits. And the other odd part about it is that you can get it completely painted for $40. Really? Yeah, like one of the one of the add-ons it says painted set forty dollars, and I I don't know why you would not do that for forty bucks. I'm in for the painted. If I've never actually played Cleopatra, so I'm gonna go. <laughs> I'm gonna go over the rules, and if it's something that I think I enjoy playing, then yeah, I'm in for the painted set for sure. It's okay, but same thing is happening with Trickshot for what it's worth. You can get painted minis on Trickshot for a twenty dollar premium there, nice. and painted minis might be coming back. You know, they, they were they were here for a while, the golden age of Heroescape, where painted minis were a thing, you know, claustrophobia and Heroescape and a bunch of other games, you could have pre-painted minis. Uh, and then they went away for a long time, and now they, maybe they're coming back. That's great. We can only hope. Finally, a bit of news that I'm surprised you didn't mention. Scythe is coming out with a modular board under the aegis of things that people have been asking for for a long time, but it's finally coming to pass. I'm exceptionally dubious, because if my experience with the Rise of Fenris is any indication, it's that... Scythe mostly works because of how focused and narrow it is. And the moment you start meddling around with random start setups or random power distributions or what have you, things start to seem very arbitrary very quickly. Like, for example, it is important that the factions that don't have speed but don't, uh, but, and don't have river walk are of a very particular geographical setup. They need to be very, very determined in terms of how they're they're situated. But the moment you start messing with that, things get bizarre. And so I'm a little bit nervous about how they're going to be doing this, but I'm sure that uh, Jamie Stigmeyer thinks he knows what he's doing, and I'm sure everyone will love it. And you're, you're probably going to get a copy anyway, right? No. No. Uh, more on this you're, later. You're, yeah, I'll talk about something like this later. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to hearing it. So that's the news and why it doesn't matter. Onward to our topic, and this is one that I suggested. This is The topic is good games that induce pain because sometimes when you're playing a game, it's just painful because it's bad. And either the company's bad or the game is bad, but sometimes there's a – sometimes just Walker, it hurts so good. It's, it's true, but how about – let's just go right into it. Games, sure. Games that have too many expansions. Sure. So games like Mystic Veil vale or Now Scythe or, or – uh, Carcassonne or, or oh my lord, Terraforming Mars, where you open the box and it's it's like the base was so good. Yet remember having such good fun, but now you look at it and it's like, what what do we play with? What do we add in? What was good? I don't remember. Close the box, grab something else. <laughs> so games that are great, but that just when they when they try to drill it for too much money by bringing out all these expansions, it just becomes painful. Ah. Uh. The painful, nostalgic impulse of remembering back when a game brought you joy, and now it just brings you pain. Now it just brings you pain. Ah, oh, that's too bad. So you're, what, what you're saying is, is getting the Scythe modular board might bring Scythe over into that territory, is what you're I saying. think it's already there. Really? With Fenris, yeah. When you open up now, it's had all this stuff, and it's just like, okay. Well, but Fenris is so ignorable. You can just leave those to the side. It's and... true. But, I mean, it's the fact that it's there. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm sorry, man. That's too bad. 
<laughs> any more any more positive uh, experiences of no, I, what I have is all these things that make them painful, and then examples. Okay, too long of a setup, and we already talked about a game, both games like this, which is Gloomhaven and Mage Knight. These games, both these games, are fantastic. But the length of time it takes them to set up and tear down Kingdom Death Monster is also one of these. It just makes it painful. Well, Kingdom Death Monster is actually something that, that that I wanted to talk about as well in terms of you know good games that induce pain because I think yes, there's the pain of setting up, and that's non-trivial, and there's the pain of all the the, the, the paperwork. But the kind of exquisite suffering that I want to talk about, uh, primarily in terms of something like Kingdom Death, is just. The game punches you in the face repeatedly over and over and over again all the time. And that's its charm, right? Yes. Because there's lots of suffering involved in gaming, either because the game is bad or because it's a it's an aspect of a game that you don't enjoy. But sometimes the pain is the good bits. And I don't think Kingdom Death would work if it weren't so painful, at least in that context. No, you really need to get it into your head right away that you're not playing characters, that you're playing sets of gear because your character's going to die do not get attached. These are Game of Thrones characters. <laughs> they will soon be dead. Sure. Too long to play. Like level 7, lots of other games. Which, sorry, which level 7? Invasion or Omega Protocol? level 7, Invasion. Yeah. It's a fantastic, huge co-op game that plays very much like Pandemic, that has all these interesting abilities and powers and mechanisms and and you know, upgradable things and everything that you'd want in a game, but it just takes too long to play. I wish, actually, that Level 7 Invasion had more of this good kind of pain that I like. Because one of the one of the things that I had against Level 7 Invasion is that I never really felt like I was in danger. It really was the case that we were able to just deal with all the alien threats. The only tool, tool that the aliens seemed to have in their disposal was just showing up in a random place after you'd already deployed your troops. That didn't feel satisfying. I'd rather feel like there was this tremendous horde of aliens that I can't begin to deal with. I have to pick my stop, spots and try to hold on, but... Well, we were playing on on entry level, so they fine. Do, they do have they do have levels that you can play. So okay, we'll see. okay. Next, I have is you always need to read the rules, reread the rules, or there's always you know the, that ambigu ambigu <laughs> ambigugu ambigugu yes. ambiguity. Sometimes they always have to sort of parse out the rules every time you play it. There's some games you know you just open the box, set up, you never even touch the rule book. But then there's always that one game. Like Caverna, that has like a four-page where you can put animals and how they work section that you always have to go over yet again to figure out how it works. And that's kind of painful when you have to reread the rules every time you play the game. Well, that was, that's basically the problem that I was trying to articulate with Brook City. Because the rules themselves are fine, but the actual rules of the game consist largely of the different case and criminal sets that you have. And there, the information is spread out on these cards, and in order, it's almost impossible to internalize everything, at least from my perspective. And so, yeah, there's a good game there. It's just the process of trying to get there was, was – I was separated by too much painful management in order to get there. There are – I mean, there are games where I think – Sometimes, though, the game seeks to make you suffer, and that's what we like about it, though. I'm thinking specifically of uh, a couple of games we both like by uh, Vladik Vadal, namely Galaxy Trucker and Space Alert, right? There, the pain is baked into the design. Gotcha. In Galaxy Trucker, yes, you've got a lot of the, the elements of the setup. You've got a lot of the elements of a lot of components. And sometimes, maybe, yes, if you don't have enough discipline, you have that element of opening up and saying there are too many expansions here. But at least in Galaxy Trucker, you can use that to tailor the difficulty level for everybody. And then because, because the job of a good game of Galaxy Trucker is to make everyone suffer and see the fruits of all their labors blow up and disintegrate in a giant fireball of death. The same largely is true of Space Alert, where, you know, a successful mission is satisfying, but, you know, you do feel a little bit cheated if it's the case that you didn't get by by the skin of your teeth. Exactly. Oh, see, all my examples are actual real suffering to my personal body, where yours well, then, are baked into the game mechanics. Well, yeah, because, you see, I wanted, I wanted I to focus on games that were still good despite the suffering, whereas gotcha. you wanted to, I think, emphasize, and this is a perfectly fine difference of focus, you wanted to emphasize uh, games that could have been good if they didn't inspire pain, which is fine. Well, th- well uh, I'll, while you're talking there, let me just Mage Knight. There's that one character... That the more damage you take, the the cooler she gets. So there's one example of of an actual baked in thing. Yeah, sk- skirting the line where you want to have lots of damage, 
uh, but you can't have too much. Yeah, a lot of characters have those where uh, I was actually playing a character like that in Brook City where the job is to accumulate enough damage so that you now become incredibly effective but not too much damage because then then you'll get knocked out. So my next real pain is when players use the same strategy every time in a game. The game could be fantastic, like Great Western Trail, but you get into it again, and the same players use the same strategy over and over again, and it's painful to play. What, why do you find that painful? I just do. It's like because there's so much to explore. There's so many other things you can do to try to interact with, to try to you know, increase or you know, do up differently, you know, try something different, and it's just... It's sad to see these guys just do the same thing every time. Oh, that's too bad because I, I worry then that you might get sick of playing things like Too Many Bones or Feast for Odin with me. Because as I've said repeatedly, I love the fact that these games are wide open and you can choose any number of specializations and every, every different tactics. And I love the fact that those are open to me. And yet I always find myself doing the exact same thing. And I'm kind of okay with that. I've made my peace with that about myself. But uh, that might drive you up, up the wall as a result. Hardly any of my games are missing pieces. In fact, I can't think of any oh, man. that I'm missing pieces of. There's some that uh, when they got when I opened them up, they had wrong pieces and I got them replaced. But I have one game, uh, Sid Meier's Civilization by uh, Fantasy Flight, that somehow there was water damage done. I forget exactly how. I think someone spilled a drink or something. Mm. Some of the tokens got destroyed. So I know it's a game that has pieces that are missing it's still playable and whatever because it was like from a random draw of pieces you know you, you take it but i know that some of them aren't there and that kind of thing drives me crazy and causes me pain it's just it's just the, the mere knowledge causes you some psychic damage exactly wow so there's one game actually that, that i i wanted to talk about and i wanted to know if you had any experience with it this is an old uh, well old uh, turn of the century uh Kiesling and cromer design called pueblo have you ever played it i might have it doesn't ring a bell The great thing about Pueblo, I'll say this. I've never played Pueblo, but I've seen many games played. I will always happily watch people play Pueblo, but I've never played it myself, and here's why. It's one of those games where points are bad, and everything you do gives you points. I don't know if you've ever played a game like that before. Every move is torture. Everything, it's it's a game of pure schadenfreude. All that you do in the game is you try to minimize your own bleeding and try to make sure that everyone else suffers as, as badly as you do, which is weird because it's this cute little game about an overseer wandering around and looking at lovely, chunky wooden pieces that you use to build this massive structure in the middle of the board. Uh, but mostly the fact that every move is so unfortunate and there's no there are no good turns, there are no good moves for you. A good move is where you don't suffer too badly. It's just so much delicious suffering and it's still a quality design it's 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 those experiences that you know i i absolutely have the same experience as you're talking about of you know contemplating my incomplete game or contemplating a game that is now too bloated for its own good but sometimes there's a peculiar kind of pain that i actually really appreciate and there there's the one of pueblo there's also this routinely happens one of the most common things that i say while playing some games is i am not a smart man because i immediately observe that all my planning is for naught and usually that's when i'm playing splatter games splatter games for me are to a certain extent the epitome of this of this delicious suffering uh, i'm thinking particularly of antiquity not so much food chain magnate because usually in food chain magnate when i'm losing i know who to blame it's that person selling beer and they ruined my day. Uh, but when I'm playing Antiquity, I know it's my own fault. When I look at the the, the, the the pollution that I've made and the graves that I've found and the fact that I don't have room now for a, to build a second city and I'm never going to be able to build that cathedral again, I know it's my own fault. I feel like such a moron and I love the game for making me suffer so. Are you familiar with that sensation? I am. Where you just made the totally not optimal play and you just look down at the table and you realize that you've ruined your own game. But do you ever derive any satisfaction from it? It's a peculiar oh, yes. kind of sadism. Yes, that... exactly. It's like, I've done it again. Yeah. <laughs> I am awesome. <laughs> it, it, it's weird because uh, I remember one of the... This was a design trend that uh, to a certain extent is, is very much true of Splatter and they've been doing this for a long time. But in terms of mainstream heroes, I associated as really starting with Agricola and having to feed your family and all that stuff. And there was a couple of years where it was very much the dominant design theme. I, I remember I remember actually the, the, the turning point where I no longer thought that Stefan Feld was any good. And that was all the games he released after In the Year of the Dragon. Because In the Year of the Dragon is very much the same thing. Everything is bad. I think there's pretty much only one action that you can do that's solidly good. The rest of it is just pain management. And I really liked In the Year of the Dragon. I also liked uh, Notre Dame that he, he, he released before that. There you go. There's my French quota for the, the episode. There you go. Good uh, job. 
you know, before he went into Point Salad, before he went into the standard tracks on tracks on tracks, he 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 could design some really tight Euro games, and one of them, which induced that beautiful kind of suffering, was in the Year of the Dragon. So I still have very fond memories of that game in particular. All right, some real pain uh, when you're playing games that on your first play it's impossible to do well, right? So that's painful, but. When you've played it multiple times or a few players at the, at, at the table have played it multiple times and you've brought in a new player and watching them struggle, that's very painful. Yeah, especially if they're not able to. Some people love that. Again, on the, the just of general, you know, sadism and masochism, some people adore the fact that a game is kicking their butts and they think this demonstrates that there's a skill horizon. Uh, which which reminds me of another game that can be very, very painful, both in the sense of frustrating for new players and satisfying for experienced players, and that's Tigers and Euphrates. Most people that I, I speak to about Tigers and Euphrates, even though they love it, because any sane person does, it very often feels like you're losing the entire game. You know, very very rarely is it the case that someone's like, yeah, I'm dominant, I'm crushing this. Most of the time it's like, oh, everything is terrible. <laughs> I can't true. get anywhere. I need blue cubes. I need points. Oh, this is awful. But everyone is feeling that way. My example was Gaia Project. You know, people that have played it, you know, more than once, you know, flourish. Whereas when it's your first play, you have like sometimes, depending on the player, of course, you have no idea what's going on and you get stomped. Uh, Next one I have is games that many enjoy because you know the mechanics are great. You understand why they like them. You enjoy, they enjoy it very much and you know it's sound mechanics, but you hate it anyway. (laughs) <laughs> like Spirit Island. I recognize Spirit <laughs> Island is a great game sure. and everything else, but it is not for me, and I find it very painful to play. When was the last time you had to play, anyway? Uh, not for quite a while, Yeah, but, thankfully. Yeah, no no one ma- – look, there are enough people that want to play Spirit Island desperately that, you know, no one's forcing you to do it. Yeah, so. I don't know what their problem is. I don't know why you're complaining all the time about maybe the one or two times you played Spirit Island. Because it's funny. Them. Okay. All right, fine. How about games where you need a certain number of players and it's impossible to get that number? That is so frustrating, it's yes. It's like you've worked it out, you've invited this many people, but of course one person doesn't show up or or all the people show up, but one's brought a friend. Thank you for that. <laughs> That's great because now we can't play this game that I never get to play because we need exactly this many players. That was one of the great things about organizing Mega Civ, which we should really do again, by the way. The great thing about Mega Civilization is the player count is so flexible. You know, if you're if you're planning, we planned for, I think, nine people to show up. A couple of people will drop out? Fine. I don't even need to change the map. I just need to change a couple setup things. Five people bring friends? No problem. That's fine. I mean, we would have run out of place in your your home. Yes. But in terms of the game accommodating, it was somebody showed up that didn't RSVP. Not a problem. Somebody had to leave early. Not a problem. It was great. And that's one of the reasons why I'm not able to play Space Cadets Dice Tool very often. You loathe the game. And any high player count game, especially ones that are divisive, that really emphasizes that kind of pain. Because if you get six people around a table, it's one of the reasons why I don't get to play Guards of Atlantis nearly as much as I like. Because the contexts in which we frequently get six together, one of them doesn't like Guards of Atlantis. And it's a very, you know, it's it's, it's a very uh, unique design. And so it's, it's understandable that there are some people that don't enjoy it. But the more people you get around a table, the greater the odds of someone taking a miss. And so my example is Star Wars Rebellion. It's a two player game, pseudo four, but really a two player game. And we just never, you know, when it is a two, when we have two players, we usually want something quick, nasty, deadly, whereas Rebellion is like a couple hour in depth jaunt. And so it's very painful that I don't get to the table, you know, more than I do. Like I got the expansion for it like years ago and I've yet to play it with the expansion. So that is very unfortunate and painful. (laughs) <laughs> For me, some of the most uh, painful decisions that a game can inspire, uh, specifically in the context of a game, is uh, certain kinds of auctions can just be excruciating, either good or bad. Uh, most recently, there was the game of the estates that we played. And I read about session reports of people playing the estates and ending with a winning score of zero. And I have no difficulty imagining that whatsoever because of how vicious and painful every bid is. There was a game called Before the Wind, which had similarly aggressive bids where you try to dump uh, things off onto people that they can't deal with them. Uh, Stevenson's Rocket sometimes has those really, really painful moments of of suffering where you have to force someone to a no-win situation, although that's usually someone's uh, deliberate play. Same thing with Chicago Express. Chicago Express is a brilliant auction game. But I remember in particular in terms of just 
This is less of a, of a good pain and more of just a, a, a painful pain. There was a two-player auction game called Medici versus Strozzi by uh, Rainer Knizia. And Rainer Knizia, I love Rainer Knizia auction, auction games. But there's one very strange feature of Medici versus Strozzi, and that is almost invariably you end up with less money than you started with. And this is a game about being merchants. And so it just felt so painful because you knew you were losing money hand over fist, even while you were winning. It was one of those weird things like the, like the penny auction where you're doomed to, to, to lose money regardless of what happens. It's a bizarre situation, but I, I do appreciate games that put you in those strange situations. All right, my last one is when, when games get played too often, it starts to get a little painful. Like our... One group that we go to had, was playing Terraforming Mars over and over again, and it just seemed, after a while, it seemed as though it was getting painful to play. It's like, okay, there's so many other games. Why don't we just play something else for a change? Can we please stop playing Terraforming Mars? <laughs> I, I'm not saying it's just Terraforming. Are Any you, games, if you play it, the more Are you trying again. to troll me? Yes. Okay. 100%. I'm not going to take the bait. I'm not going to feed the troll. So what, the other thing I was thinking about, I don't want to, it's, maybe I sound conceited, but when you see there's an actual game mechanic flaw or there's something that that would make the game 100% better if they just did that, and it's almost always graduated decks. It's, oh, yeah, I always look at it. It's, like, it's like they have this giant thing, and it's like, okay, we're go- cycling through this. Why didn't they graduate that? Why didn't they slowly make it harder? Why am I drawing this giant monster at the beginning? Why didn't they just put that at the bottom? Why didn't they graduate that deck? It was so easy to do. Why didn't they do it? That's painful. It must be painful to know so much better than everyone around you, Walker. Exactly. It's very painful to, to be a better game designer than all the other game designers out there when I haven't even designed a single game. So it, it, it's painful to me. But you deal with it so well and you never complain. Uh, it's so true. You know, I'm just you know, modest that way, I guess. So that's going to do it for this week. Thank you very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at The Games You Like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236, and you can find us on Patreon. We read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Next week. You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>